Hello and welcome to Worship This Day at whatever day or time you are joining us. I'm glad you chose to spend some time with us and I hope things and life are treating you well. As far as announcements for our congregation, we already have a few. Uh, one is our Thanksgiving sign up is available at the church. So what that is, is we buy items and serve a Thanksgiving dinner to those that may not have family in the area and things of that nature. So with that, if you are somebody who lives out of town but want to support that ministry, you can write a check and send a check in and make a note on it that it's for Thanksgiving. If you are somebody who lives in town, give us a call in the office so we can get you signed up for a specific item or for whether you're going to attend that Thanksgiving. Now, when I say attend, I mean receive a meal because we are not doing in, an in-person gathering for it. Just logistically with COVID and everything, it's, it's too much to worry about, but we are still going to provide it. I also want to remind you about your offering. Uh, your generous giving has been helping us to maintain our ministries. It's been, as anybody can tell you who works in any, any industry, it's been a weird financial year. But we are grateful for your giving, and we want to encourage you to continue that giving. Those are all the announcements that I have that I'm aware of at the moment. So again, thank you for joining us. Bow your heads in prayer with me. Almighty God, you spoke to our ancestors long ago through the prophets and teachers. But today you speak to us through your Son. In the midst of life's trials and tribulations, help us keep our integrity and walk faithfully in your ways. Help us listen to the words of your Son and become like children again, that we may rejoice in your kingdom and trust in your Spirit. Amen. Our scripture reading today is Psalm 26, and of course it's the entire psalm. Uh, I want to encourage you, I'm reading the NRSV version, but please read other versions as well, especially with the psalm that's helpful to hear different versions and how they might say something. Listen for the voice of God. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and mind, for your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in faithfulness to you. I do not sit with the worthless, nor do I consort with the hypocrites. I hate the company of evildoers, and will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, singing aloud a song of thanksgiving and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the house in which you dwell and the place where your glory abides. Do not sweep me away with sinners, nor my life with the bloodthirsty. Those in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I walk in integrity, in, in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great congregation, I will bless the Lord. Here ends the reading of God's word for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In 1983, a man by the name of Walter Forbes was tried and convicted of arson. Uh, that arson resulted in the death of an individual. Walter had been, uh, I believe he was condemned to a lifetime in prison. He had spent 40 years there maintaining his innocence. And just in 2020, he was exonerated and released from prison. This is after finding out that the star witness against him, the person who placed him at the scene of the crime, had been threatened with bodily harm to make false witness against him. Uh, and that individual was threatened by those who started the fire. I would like to say that this is a unique situation, that you know our justice system doesn't make very many mistakes like this. And more often than not, the people who are sent to prison are in fact guilty. 
the statistics, however, just don't hold that up. M many individuals who are on death row are actually falsely imprisoned and, in fact, innocent. This example I gave is just one in, unfortunately, many, many cases of this. Uh, this fact that so many people who are innocent are still on death row is one of the many reasons that the, the church, the Methodist church as a whole, has taken a stance against the death penalty. Proclaiming your innocence is something that seems to have a counterintuitive effect. Uh, when someone proclaims their innocence, we often think they, they uh, did, did the, the thing they're being accused of. Um, I had listened to a podcast just the other day, and it talked about this phenomenon that the people who are innocent genuinely tend to get mad and, and upset that they have been accused. Now, these things are not necessarily signs that the person is automatically innocent, of course. Um, but what what happens is when somebody says they're innocent and, and they get mad or upset or offended that, that they've been accused, we see anger as a less trustworthy emotion, so we're more likely to see them as guilty. Psalm 26 speaks to the psalmist going before God and asking God to judge them based upon their righteousness. Uh, the idea be here being that the person who is asking for judgment believes in their innocence and that they petition God because they are innocent and that God will judge them as so. We don't really know the exact historical circumstance of this psalm. Some theorize it was written by David, and um, this would have been a prayer he said when he was falsely accused by his enemies. Others feel that this was a prayer for the high priest because of some of the wording about washing your hands and walking around the altar, a place that only the high priest would be. Uh, so this was a, a, a prayer that the high priest would pray as they prepared themselves to perform uh, sacrifices for God. For us, we're neither high priest nor king. Uh, these historical scenarios are things that don't really help us as far as understanding how to use this psalm and what it's trying to show us in our lives. Uh, the danger in this psalm is that by asking God to judge us based on righteousness, we tend to head to self-righteousness. Uh, another danger is that this psalm compares their activity to the wicked and, and uh, evildoers and what their activity is. And, and what happens is this can cause an us versus them mentality where we're the only righteous ones, we're the only good people who deserve God's grace, and anyone, and this is what it becomes, anyone who does not worship like us, or think like us, or act like us, or look like us, well, they, they just don't deserve it. I think this song speaks to our lives when we look at a time that we wished justice was real. Uh, th there's always an inherent danger when we talk about justice and God, and that is that we confuse God's justice with our own. Uh, there are many good Christian people who are quick to respond with a vig vigilante type justice, you know, the whole eye for an eye. So you took a life, you get your life taken away. And uh, we like justice like that. It's, it's easy to accomplish. We can see it. We can head directly for it. But the justice of God is something deeper and far more difficult to live out. Uh, the, the person who sang this song are, is talking about being in a relationship with God. Because we should know, anyway, that our own righteousness is not enough. No matter how good we act or how good we think our lives are, we're never good enough to earn what we should have or what we hope we should have. We know that ultimately we rely on God's grace. Uh, and God's justice and God's grace has always or should always be coupled together. That enables us to be called the people of God and, and enables us to say 
that we walk with God because we know we're going to fall short, but God has grace for us. The invitation to examine ourself uh, is to, to look at why we are talking about righteousness. You know, we, I mean, we could talk about righteousness and, and, and proclaim ourselves righteousness, and then it could, it could backfire, right? Um, because we could try to apply that righteousness to others. We try to apply what we believe is right and wrong to others. So this is, this is the problem with self-righteousness. And, and often self-righteousness becomes legislated upon others, at least in our country, you know, making activities legal or illegal. And it misses the point of God's justice and God's grace. It really doesn't take too long to see the results of this in our churches and in our world. We, we have those who believe legislating their beliefs is more important than other people's rights. Now, I have to say this, unfortunately, and I wanted to stay away from hot button issues, but I have to say this because I don't want anybody to walk away thinking that I'm talking about mass mandates because I'm not. Uh, I'm talking about things like outlawing abortion. The issue here is that Christians don't live up to what they proclaim. They, they're living out self-righteousness and not actually living what you preach. We proclaim all life is sacred, and then we do all sorts of legislation to not, in fact, allow that to happen. You know, we, we say all life is sacred and, and life begins at conception, and then promptly when the child is born, we no longer feel it's our responsibility to properly fund the school because, you know, well, my kids are already grown up and gone or whatever the case might be. And I've actually heard those things over the years. That's part of the issue that the psalmist talks about righteousness. And when the psalmist talks about right, righteousness, what we're talking about is an outward journey that is turned inwards. In other words, the outward journey of trying to be a good person, but it's turned inwards to where it is pointing out where we are at fault. So, for instance, one of the root problems in American Christianity and American churches is we preach a Jesus of love and acceptance and of grace, and then we judge and we exclude. We, we preach that God has grace for all, except for someone who's gay, except for someone who doesn't look like us or talk like us, dresses well enough. We take that righteousness and turn it into self-righteousness as opposed to turning inwards and seeing how our own hearts must be changed so that we may give grace to others to have the same journey, whatever that journey might be. We know our righteousness is not sufficient to save us. That's a basic thing that we teach and preach about, right? We have to remember, though, that watching and seeing what is right and wrong is not sufficient enough, that ultimately God is the judge. And what I want to invite you to do this week as you go forward in your spiritual life is turn your own judgment inwards. And... and I want to be careful with that because sometimes we can actually judge ourselves way too harshly and hold ourselves to a standard that is unattainable. I don't mean that. I mean, the fact is the, the church has rolled over so many innocent people in its, in its existence uh, instead of lifting people up. And I think if we focus a little bit inwards on ourselves when we talk about righteousness, when we talk about justice and right and wrong, and look how we have experienced justice, and in turn how we have experienced grace, we can have a better relationship with God, and in turn, that enables us to be better people for others and lift other people up. You know, it's about how do we, we have those expectations of being a good Christian, a good follower of Christ, how do we bring others along on that journey without forcing others? And I don't necessarily have the answer to those things. But I want to encourage you, based on this psalm, we need to have a, a working relationship with God. 
when we talk about justice and righteousness. Stay happy, healthy, and safe this week. Amen. I would like to remind you that this is com uh, a communion Sunday. So if you are watching this and at any time that you are watching this, feel free to go and find our Love Feast video and participate. When this video comes out in particular, it will be World Communion Sunday, which is the time that we Christians celebrate when everybody's taking communion together, as opposed to how often we take it separately. So if you have that, go ahead and, and turn to that video now, and we'll see you again soon.